Over the summer, I started an experiment involving chicken. In today's video, I'm gonna reveal the results of that experiment, as well as what I learned and what I'm gonna do different next year. Today's video is sponsored by my friends at BarkBox. Oof, it's a rainy one. Where's Mr. Toby Dog? But he's probably in his house, trying to keep dry or something. Oh, yep, there he is. I don't know if you can see, but he just popped out. <laughs> hey, buddy. You found your nice little dry spot? I'm really glad you're using that house. Good morning, pal. Good morning. How are you? That's good to see you. Good morning, chickens. It's time to rise and or shine. I will admit, ever since we culled out the roosters, the flock's gotten a lot smaller, a lot more calm. Uh, you can see Dottie here has been growing in her feathers. Her sister Blanche, if you remember about two weeks ago, was looking ragamuffin. Now she's looking beautiful. But of course on a rainy day like today, the chickens aren't gonna be happy regardless. And to answer your question, yes, we have actually gone through our annual cull of our roosters, which actually relates to the experiment that I've been running. You know, earlier this summer, I decided to hatch out the chicken eggs that our girls were laying. You know, we had two roosters, and yes, I said had, General Washington and Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And General Washington was a Rhode Island Red. Alexander Hamilton was a Bielenfelder, however you say that one. Those two fellas had a flock that included a Crevacoir, a Colombian Wyandotte, a couple of Bard Rocks, a couple of Leghorns, a couple of uh, New Hampshire Reds, a Plymouth Rock, a Black Cochin, an Ancona. You know, just a whole mishmash mix of lady chicken. And my idea was, I want to have more laying hens for next year so that they can follow our cattle. But I knew that in hatching my own eggs, I would produce a whole heck of a lot of roosters. And so the intention was to see, with this experiment, could I ethically raise good meat birds? And by ethically, I mean not raising the freakish Cornus cross, making sure that these chickens have a long enough life where they're actually experiencing the world, and doing something that would be cost-effective for me as the farmer that wouldn't break my wallet, as well as produce a meat product that wouldn't suck. And so yeah, earlier this week, I took the day off from work and culled all the roosters. I actually did it all by myself. I've done butchering here on the farm now for several years, but this was the first time I ever did it all by myself. But it went pretty smoothly. Good morning, weird chickens. So now at this point on the farm, Penny the Silky Rooster is the only rooster we have on our entire farm. And I will admit, I'm a little bit sad about it. So when it came to when I butchered the roosters, we had 20 young cockerels that had been hatched out this summer, plus Alexander Hamilton and General Washington. I actually tried to find homes for them, but nobody was really interested in taking on some roosters. And so in the name of honoring their lives, we actually treated them as food, which I know is probably a little bit controversial. But I knew that I couldn't keep Alexander Hamilton and General Washington around for future generations. You see, over the summer, I ended up hatching out 34 chicks. Of those 34 chicks, 20 of them were roosters, 14 of them were hens, and all of them were the offspring of the general and hamel hen. And so in the name of avoiding inbreeding, I decided to cull. I'm working on actually getting a couple of new roosters for next spring. You know, it's surprisingly easy to be a free home to roosters, but all 22 of those male birds are now in our freezer or I guess a couple of them are now at this point in our belly. Release the Kraken! Every day that's miserable for the chickens with the water and the rain is a great day to be a duck. They are so happy right now. If you ever have the chance, have both ducks and chickens on your farm. It's so fun to see them contrast and interact on the barnyard and just see how what makes one happy makes the other miserable and vice versa. All right, girls, out you go. So at this point, my large chicken flocks, I have two of them. I have the flock that you saw me open up earlier where the majority of the chickens are. And then I have these four ladies who are holdovers from the old flock 
who never quite separated appropriately. You see, over the last, I don't know, two months or so, Alexander Hamilhan and several of the older females ended up moving in with the younger ones, and they ended up living inside the Bruder house. But General Washington, and actually these four ladies, ended up staying inside the chicken tractor coop that I have. At some point in the next week or two, I should probably sneak in in the middle of the night and take those ladies out and put them in with the rest of the flock. And if I give it a couple of days and I do that, they'll ultimately integrate in and become one big happy flock together, especially because there are no roosters and there's plenty of space. I don't expect much like in terms of violence or issues. What are you chewing on there, Goose? Is that a wood chip? All right, you do you. In case you guys are wondering, I have not done my cull of the geese yet this year. As I've described in other videos, I'm still grappling with the issues related to the hoop house and what to do with it and determining how that whole situation gets resolved will determine how many geese I can keep over until next year. Hey, how's the buff crew doing? Yeah, you got Lenny and the Outsiders, plus Bruce the Goose and all his ladies, all as one big flock. Now to give you a little more background on the experiment, I pretty much raised those chicks just like I'd raise any other birds. For the first four or five weeks of their lives, I gave them chick starter feed, but then the remaining parts of their lives, they just got regular old food rations just like our other birds, which are a combination of layer pellets, scratch grains, cracked corn, a little bit of duck feed, mealworms, you know, just a pretty good mix of diet. But I also give my birds overall a pretty sparse diet when compared to what I do for winter because I also try to force them to forage and go through the pasture and eat all the bugs and insects and weeds and all the good stuff that's out there. And so for most of their lives, these rooster chicks, they spent a lot of time wandering around this farm. So I guess to look at one part of my experiment of wanting to raise meat chickens that had good, happy lives, I actually feel like I very much checked that box. They spent their earliest days in the brooder. As they got older, at about, you don't know, two or three weeks old, they started to have outdoor access. At four weeks old, they had even more outdoor access. And then by six weeks, they were completely free ranging. And they were born in mid-July, and I ended up butchering them in early November. I don't know, this video will probably come out a little later than that. But the actual butcher date was the beginning of November. Now, let me break down all the numbers for you guys. But first, I got to go run a quick errand. So, you know, just because Toby Dog is a working dog, doesn't mean he doesn't like to have fun things. And by fun things, I mean stuff like toys and treats and stuff to make his life as a dog that much more enjoyable. So that's why lately I've been working with BarkBox. And it looks like we just got our latest box here in the post office. Toby Dog's gonna be so excited when I get back to the farm. Hey Toby Dog, I got a surprise for you. I know you're so excited for it. Every time you see this cardboard box show up, you know what to expect. Oh boy. Toby, this one's a special Spider-Man bark box. It has a nice Spider-Man disc, a little squeaky ball, a chewable Spider-Man newspaper, a little Spider-Man doll. Toby, you don't know what to make of these squeaky toys, do you? Livestock guardian dogs usually don't get squeaky toys, but I think Toby can handle it. Ooh, and then some spider bites and chicken sticks. The dog treats that they've been sending him from bark box are like his favorite. You want one? Yes, you do. Oh, yes, he does. BarkBox is a monthly delivery of unique toys and treats and chews, all with one goal, making your dog happy. BarkBox's toys are made exclusively in-house and you can't find them anywhere else. And Toby Dog goes crazy for the treats. Each BarkBox is one of a kind and tailored towards your dog's size and allergies. And each month's BarkBox has a special theme and free shipping. Like for example, this month is all about Spider-Man. BarkBox has three different subscription options, either 12 months for $23 a box, six months for $26 a box, or one month for $35 a box. Toby's never seen a Frisbee before. I don't think he's quite sure what to make of it. Chickens are definitely curious too. <laughs> Toby's never quite figured out the whole mechanics of the game of fetch. It's a great deal and it's gonna make your dog really happy. And if you use the subscription link down below, you're gonna get a free toy with each box every month. It's a big time value, you guys. Since we're still getting soaked with rain, I'm gonna let Toby Dog play with his bark box and I'm gonna head inside to break down the numbers for you guys about the chickens. Hey Molly, it's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Aw, oh, you want Spider-Man to pet you? 
That's just adorable. I know it's called BarkBox, but I think our cats actually like the toys that come with it too. Okay, now I know you guys watched this video because you wanna get into the data, and I do have the data here. So when I talk about the great chicken experiment, let me break down the numbers for you. Again, over the summer, we hatched 34 chicks overall. Um, 12 of them turned out to be hens, 20 of them turned out to be roosters, which is kind of a weird ratio. Usually it's a 50-50 split or somewhere very close to it. To be that skewed is kind of surprising. And ultimately we ended up butchering 22 birds. Our two roosters, like adult roosters, Alexander Hamilton and General Washington, were the heaviest birds and I'm gonna like set them aside from these numbers, but their dressed weight, meaning the weight after everything's done with getting them all prepped and gutted and all that good stuff. It was 7.9 pounds for Alexander Hamilton and 7.1 pounds for General Washington. The young roosters were much lighter. They were ranging, I think the, the heaviest one that I had there was 5.1 pounds and the lightest one was like, 3.4 pounds, I think, something like that. So they were ranging between like, you know, three and a half pounds and, and five pounds as the upper limit. And that's kind of normal for a, a bird that's 16 weeks old. The average weight for my young roosters ended up being 4.115 pounds. And in terms of some of the costs that you might be interested in, it took me roughly 256 pounds of food to feed these birds. It's like six and a half bags of feed. Uh, based on the feed bags that we use. Ultimately, the birds produced a total of 82.3 pounds of meat. The real thing that you guys are probably wondering is how does this compare to other operations? Remember, I was setting out to do this as an ethical way to raise meat chickens as a byproduct of raising laying hens. And really, when it comes down to it, to do something like that right, I really need to be thinking about contrasting what I did here in this experiment to a more standard, more traditional model for raising chickens. And that's where my buddy John Siskovich comes in. So if you guys don't know him, John Siskovich has his own YouTube channel. He also used to have a podcast. He is a super smart guy. He runs a farm. He actually works at a really famous brewery and he has a little consulting company called Farm Marketing Solutions. You know, he really helps farmers think about their business. John, also very notably, is the inventor of the Siskovich model stress-free chicken tractor. It's that chicken tractor that you see around on homesteads and farms all across the country and really all around the world. It's one of the best designs. I've built several of them for our farm here. I highly recommend it. It's my favorite design of chicken tractor. John sells like a version of the plans on his website. He he also sells a product known as the Pastured Poultry Packet. That is essentially a whole setup and template for you if you wanted to start marketing your own meat chickens. And what's nice about John is he is a data geek. He loves to collect data. And so I reached out to John to actually get some numbers to compare and contrast what I did with my experiment to what he does when he's raising meat burns on his farm. His model is much more traditional. He's raising Cornish cross chickens. He's doing them for about eight weeks. He keeps them in his chicken tractors and moves them along every day. So you are getting very good organic pasture raised birds, but you're not getting birds that are running around completely free range like we had at our farm. And so what I decided to do is take a cost comparison per bird of one of John's meat birds versus one of my meat birds. You know, John pays $1.43 for each chick from a hatchery. Meanwhile, you could actually make the case that my chicks were free because I just took some of my eggs from the farm and chucked them in an incubator. But you know, you do need to calculate for the cost of electricity and the cost of the egg. And so I roughly arrived at 50 cents per chick as my cost per bird. When the chicks are young, you need heat. And so John has about nine cents per bird for his cost of heat. I'd say mine's a little higher because I'm doing fewer birds and, and so I have less scalability. And so it's about 20 cents per bird. For certain numbers, I didn't really track my data as good as I should. And so I just kind of used the same number that John did so I can have a somewhat apples to apples comparison. A lot of these costs though are very negligible, things like shaving and grit. And then also my labor costs, I didn't really track my hours. John John meticulously tracks his hours. And so I'm going to just assume that we were both at $4.24 when it comes to the labor of supporting raising the birds. The biggest difference by far when you look at the cost structure is per bird, it cost John $6.77 to feed the bird for its entire life. Meanwhile, I was at $12.80 per bird over the life of that bird. That is a pretty sizable difference. 
and I know that that's gonna ultimately impact the bottom line cost that I have to deal with here when I get to the grand total. If I'm actually looking at our feed costs, like as we're buying per bag of feed, it's actually very, very close, you know, what John pays versus what I pay, so that is apples to apples. I think the biggest difference is the fact that John only raises his birds for eight weeks. Meanwhile, I had my birds around for a total of 16 weeks. That's twice as long. That makes a big difference in your feed cost, and that makes a good sense of why my feed cost would be almost twice as much as his. In terms of processing costs, John ends up taking his birds and sending them off to a processor. Meanwhile, what I did for my experiment birds is I processed them all myself. And so he has a per bird cost of $5.30. While if I look at my hours and then divide it by $12 an hour, I'm at about $4.36 per bird. But because John's taking his birds to a processor, he has to think about the cost of gasoline. I don't have to do that, so I get a zero. He has a 50 cent charge. Cost of storage, like keeping them in the freezer. You know, John uses 50 cents as his plug. I just kind of took his number as well. John also vaccinates his birds. I don't do any of that, so I didn't have a cost there. The total cost per bird ended up looking actually somewhat similar. Again, I saved money on the chicks. I saved money on the processing, but I ended up spending a lot more money on feed. And so while John's birds cost $19.14 to produce an average bird, mine cost $22.68. John's average weight per bird was actually much higher than mine. Even though his birds were only eight weeks old and my birds were 16 weeks old, they were 4.832 pounds per bird on average for John's birds. Meanwhile, mine checked in at 4.115 pounds per bird. That's where those Cornish cross birds make such a big difference to your business model. And so if you take all of these costs and you take the average weight and ultimately get it down to what's it cost per pound of meat? We're talking about $3.96 per pound from John, while meanwhile, my little roosters cost $5.51 per pound of meat. Admittedly, that is a very sizable difference. And so if I'm thinking about my experiment as a business enterprise, I think it's kind of not gonna hold up. You know, when you look at John's costs, right, it's pretty reasonable to charge your consumer $5 or $5.25 per pound for what you're selling to them. To make a similar margin, you'd have to charge somebody like, I don't know, six or seven bucks per pound per bird. That makes a huge difference. And so over the course of this year, I hope I have addressed a burning question that many of you had of, is it more economical to just raise roosters for meat? or is it better to go the traditional route to raise your meat birds? If you're just looking at the cost side of things, the meat bird approach is absolutely the better approach. Now, the other question some of you might have about the meat birds that I raised is, how was the actual meat? If you think about John's meat and what his birds taste like, or probably taste like because I've never tasted them specifically, but I've tasted birds that have been raised in a very similar fashion, it is very much the big, kind of meaty chicken that Americans have grown used to. It tastes like chicken, it tastes great, it's got nice yellow fat to it. it, it's a good, good product. If I think about my roosters though, they were a little bit different. They were most definitely less meaty. Most notably, the breast portion of the meat bird was much less pronounced compared to like I say, a traditional Cornish cross. But I actually think I preferred the flavor of our birds. It wasn't tough, it wasn't stringy, it was still very good to eat. You could easily roast it, you could easily cook it like on a grill or something. But I found that it had like the more complex flavor of like dark meat than say like a traditional Cornish cross chicken. I personally really like that. I think some people really like that in general. I know it's not for everybody though. I think the major contributors there are number one, genetics. You know, the Cornish cross is just gonna grow bigger and meatier just because of its freakish genetics. But then number two, when I look at the lifestyle of the birds, it's very different. You know, John's birds are in a chicken tractor, they're pecking away, they're outside, they're, they're not in any sort of factory situation, so I don't wanna portray it as anything such as that. But my birds were out there running around, living their best life. They were chasing after bugs, they were running around, chasing each other, fighting with each other, picking through stuff. They were going crazy, they were having a good time. And so I think that that active lifestyle contributes to the more dark meat style bird that I ultimately produced. So let's bring it all together. If I'm thinking about cost, I think that my experiment failed relative to the more traditional model. If I'm thinking about taste, I'm gonna call it a draw. If I'm thinking about 
the ethic side of it, I am gonna give myself the the plus because I actually do think that the birds led a more bird-like life. And if you really care about seeing the chickenness of a chicken being truly expressed, I think the model that we tried here this summer did that better than the more traditional model. Again, not that I'm really knocking the traditional model, I'm just comparing and saying one is a little bit better than the other. And so all in all, I would actually kind of call this contest a draw. I think the real question that some of you might be wondering is, will I try to do this again next year? And the answer is yes, 100%. The reason I plan to do this next year is number one, I need more layer hens, and so I wanna keep hatching more layer hens, and I enjoy raising the baby birds. And so just from that standpoint alone, I think I would be stuck with these roosters to begin with. And while I could go to a hatchery and just buy the female chicks, I actually like the fact that I'm taking responsibility for the male birds and raising them myself and putting them to good use. I will also say that, yeah, it produces a more expensive meat, but if this is just going into the freezer and it's something that Allison and I are eating over the next couple of months and it's something we might be sharing with friends and family, it's not necessarily exorbitantly expensive. You know, if I'm looking at it just from a pure cost standpoint, right, the way that I raised those birds is about 30% more expensive. And I don't think that this will ever make sense as a business model, but for me personally, I'm happy to pay that extra 30% to have chicken in the freezer that I know lived a great chicken life. And so yes, I do intend to do this again. Now if you've enjoyed this experiment and wanna really look back at how all of this started, I'll leave a link to the original video over here. I definitely recommend you check it out. You know, I gotta say one of the reasons I love doing YouTube videos is it gives me this opportunity to step back and look back at what happened previously at the farm and just relive the story. I hope you guys enjoy that too. Thanks for watching.